Okay, wonderful. So thank you so much for joining us um, today, everybody. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the tsleil Squamish, and Stolo Nations, and we are very honored and grateful to undertake our work here. My name is Jazz Keeler, and I'm very excited to be helping Griffin Art Projects out for the current and upcoming exhibition periods as a contract virtual programs coordinator. Uh, so before we begin here today, I just wanted to mention that um, participant videos and microphones are enabled for the call today. We've muted your mic automatically when you enter today, and we do ask that you keep it muted um, just throughout the presentation while the speakers um, are talking. However, it is of course an interactive workshop. So once we get to the hands-on component, there will be an opportunity for you to unmute your mics and ask questions. And our workshop facilitators will provide more detailed instructions in that regard when the time comes. I also wanted to mention that we are recording the introductions today just in order to document and archive the event. So we will be editing out any participant videos for this recording, but do feel free to keep your videos turned off until we reach that interactive component. If you're more comfortable um, doing that, it's totally up to you. But again, we will be editing out any participant um, videos as well as we will not be recording the hands-on components. So at that point, you'll be able to share your video and ask questions, and we won't be recording that. Um, so for those of you who are joining from Edmonton or out of town, I wanted to mention that Griffin Art Projects is a North Vancouver-based nonprofit art gallery and artist residency. And today's program is brought to you in anticipation of our upcoming exhibition, Who's Chinatown? Examining Chinatown Gazes in Art, Archives, and Collections, which is guest curated by Karen Tam and scheduled for presentation at Griffin Art Projects um, in January 2021. And I'm really thrilled that Karen Karen is here with us today to offer a few words of introduction about this exhibition before we get to the workshop. So Karen Tam is an artist and curator whose research focuses on the various forms of constructions and imaginations of cultures and communities through her installation work in which she recreates spaces of Chinese restaurants, karaoke lounges, opium dens, curio shops, and other sites of cultural encounters. Since 2000, Karen has exhibited her work and participated in residencies in North America, Europe, and China. Karen lives and works in Montreal and holds an MFA in sculpture from the School of Art Institute Chicago and a PhD in cultural studies from Goldsmiths University of London. So thank you so much, Karen, for being with us here today and over to you. Thanks, Jazz. Um, so yes, my name is Karen Tam, um, guest curating the upcoming exhibition called Who's Chinatown? Um, I just wanted to say that while we meet today on a virtual platform, um, and uh, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today and the importance of the land which we call home. I respectfully acknowledge the Ghana Kinhaga Nation, the protectors of the land and waters on which Jojage Montreal is located and on whose unceded ancestral lands on which I'm grateful to live and work as a racialized non-Indigenous guest. So just a few words about the exhibition. Um, I don't want to take too much time um, from the workshop. Whose Chinatown um, will bring together an art history of Chinatowns and their communities by historical and contemporary art, Canadian artists such as Aya. Um, Chinatowns have always been vibrant locales serving their residents and visitors. How have these neighborhoods and their inhabitants been depicted or have chosen to be represented? In thinking about the histories, stories, and spaces of Chinatowns and their importance to their communities as centers, what are ways that artists, art collectives, and community groups are changing public discourse, planning, and perceptions around Chinatowns? Um, the works that will be in the show share a spirit of activism and advocacy by creating dialogue around, excuse me, around cultural community and place. They map the histories and changes in our Chinatowns over the decades and attest to the existence of forgotten artists and businesses. They also ask viewers to imagine the future of Chinatowns and their heritage. So, <laughs> back to you, Jazz. 
So thank you so much, Karen, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm very happy to be introducing today's special guest. So Aya is an intergenerational group of artists and Chinatown community members who are using the tools of art and culture to make work that addresses the displacement and cultural erasure in Edmonton's Chinatown. Beginning with the 2017 removal of the Harbin Gate, Aya is compelled to create spaces of mourning and remembering. I'm now going to pass the mic over to Aya Collective member Grace Law, who will be providing further introductions today. Thanks, Chaz. Thanks for that introduction. And thank you for Karen and the Griffin Art Projects for inviting Aya um, so that we can continue this work of remembering. So before I start um, sharing with the project, I also want to say hello to everyone for coming and joining and sharing your Sunday afternoon with us. Uh, we're really excited to meet you. We have a uh, kind of some preliminary work to work to do or like sharing to do, and then uh, we'll get to um, get to know you. Um, we sh I should remind you that we're being recorded. So if you prefer not to show your face, you can turn your video. And uh, at the end of the sharing of the project and um, after Paul teaches us how to do calligraphy and after Wiling teaches us how to do crochet, we'll have some group art making time and sharing about um, our sentiments about Chinatown. In Edmonton, we're on and Ms. Gucci Weskehagen, which is Cree for Beaver Mountain House, um, or as known, or as most of us know it, so-called Edmonton. We live on the occupied land of Treaty 6 territory, a home and traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples, including the Cree, the Soto, the Nakoto Sioux, the Blackfoot, and Métis. More specifically, in Edmonton, we are on traditional territories of the Papas Chase, the Michelle Band, and Métis Land, who are not recognized by treaty unjustly. And I say this um, because the names of our land, the places where we live, is important. It's a necessary reminder of this place. And we share this treaty acknowledgement not because we have to, but because these histories and stories must be remembered and influences us today and how we make our futures. Um, it also must be acknowledged that we live in occupied lands, we are all implicated, and for those who live on treaty land, we are all treaty people. And also when we talk about Chinatowns, it also must be acknowledged that Chinatown in Edmonton is on stolen Indigenous land and there is no conversation to be had about gentrification and displacement without acknowledging colonialism. So there's four of us in Aya. Um, maybe we could just wave our hands. So there's Sean and there's Wiling and Lan too. And we have our Aya friend, Paul, uh, who will teach us uh, how to write calligraphy. So in 2017, um, the Harbin Gate was removed and um, the Chinatown community held a vigil on November 4th on a very cold night. And um, I got to come at the very end, but I missed most of it. And, but I came back the next day and stood in front of this vast emptiness and felt this heavy weight. And I asked myself, what's the role of the artist? And in this way, we're asking, we're, we'll also like to hear from you, like what is each of our roles um, when we see Chinatown today? So I asked, I'm a, I must not be the only one feeling this way. And so I looked for friends who were artists too, um, who wanted to respond to this question. So uh, Faye, I think um, she's a local artist in Edmonton who made these crazy pink lions. Um, uh, I, I asked her if she knew anyone and she invited me to join her for lunch at Double Greeting, which is a couple of blocks away from the, har the removal of the Harmon Gate. And uh, Sean came in and we all brainstormed and created this project. So, um, so because um, we wanted um, to remember the gate, um, we thought that even though the gate was gone, our community's memories of it was not gone. 
and we wanted a visual reminder of that. So uh, collectively, Sean came up with the idea of um, using uh, the characters Zhonghua Moon, which means Chinatown Gate, um, to be posed in public space because it was removed. Um, we were putting it back into public space. And Wai Ling, who was inspired by the Idle No More movement, um, who did a lot of graffiti crochet, um, came up with the idea of making these kind of doilies that are kind of re reminiscent of, um, of, I think, like decorative Chinese uh, elements um, to be part of these wishes. So, um, so this is what we're going to make today. And um, as, as we uh, listen to Paul, uh, listen to Wiling, um, I want to ask you, uh, what are your favorite things in Chinatown? Are there any things in your Chinatown that's lost? Um, the situation that Edmonton's Chinatown is in is, um, it's also similar in, the, in many cities across North America. Um, so, when we make these wishes, we are inviting people to write their memories, their hopes, and their dreams for their own Chinatown. And in Edmonton's case, um, we're making another public art installation site. Um, so, uh, we for the exhibition, we printed like 400 of the wishes that was collected in 2017. So, we're inviting people to respond again and we'll have another public installation of the site. So I'm going to pass it on to Paul. Um, and Paul has been studying under a master, Teacher Chen. Um, and actually Teacher Chen taught us how to do the calligraphy for the first Carbon Gate memory. So it's really, um, really special that Paul is teaching us how to write Zhong Wa Lu. And so I'll pass it on to Paul. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Jang. Um, my Chinese name is Gu Lei Bing Quan. Um, so as uh, Grace was saying, we met um, through the calligraphy exercise that was led by um, Mr. Uh, Chen Zhong Da, um, who um, I've been basically learning calligraphy for the last two and a half years from. So. Um, is there any, can everybody see the screen over here? Great, perfect. So um, before I talk about um, our calligraphy exercise, I do wanna kind of review some of the materials we have. Everybody should have a brush. Um, if you don't have a brush, um, that's fine. You can use a writing material um, stick like a pencil or a Sharpie even. Um, calligraphy is pretty accessible so long as you have the writing material. Um, if you do have a new brush, um, this is not the proper brush that you should be using. You can see it in front of me over here. You can see that it's quite rigid. Um, so that's a protective kind of glue that keeps it together in its shape right now. So if you do still have it new, um, you should probably wash that under hot water and make sure that like those bristles um, can, you know, relax so that the brush can function. So it's more like this brush over here where you can move the tip as you can see. Other materials that you should have is the black ink, um, as well as um, paper. Um, two other things that you might want to keep in mind is water. Um, so a cup of water would be great, as well as another cup. Um, I use usually these little things um, to hold my ink. So an inkwell is also encouraged as well. Um, if you don't have that, you can use plastic cups. You can use like a top of a, um, a jar lid, for instance, to hold that ink. So um, so long as you have those materials, we should be fine. So as we were saying, Zhonghua Moon is the name of one of the gates in Chinatown, um, Edmonton. We do have two Chinatowns actually, but we're focusing on the South one because there's a bit of politics. Um, a lot of people see South Chinatown, unfortunately, as not a Chinatown. And that has created a lot of erasure of the existing Chinatown there. Um, there's a lot of opinions, but there's a lot of community investment that's not recognized from the Chinese community, but also um, neighborhood residents in that area towards um, South Chinatown. So Zhonghua Moon means China Gate um, or the Chinese Gate. Um, Zhong meaning China, Wa means Chinese, and Moon mean, um, means Gate. 
And as you can see here, there's two different uh, two different versions that I've written down here. So there's one that's larger three by three squares over here, whereas this one's smaller at two by two squares. And here is just, just to give you a bit of scale of dime uh, and my signature um, over here as well. Um, the style that we'll be learning, so I was, I'm more used to write, writing in a walking script style, but we will be writing in a more traditional script, not a traditional, but a more cleaner script. Um, we call it kaishu, um, versus the style that I use is hangshu, which is more of a walking cursive style. Um, so some things to keep in mind when it comes to calligraphy, there are a few important components. Um, symmetry is one of them. So you notice when I use these square blocks, um, there should be some symmetry that there's equal distance between kind of how far they're reaching out left and right. Um, spacing is important also. If you look at the spacing in between, for instance, all these slots over here, the spacing is very important in terms of making sure that things are equidistance. Um, we kind of call it as balance um, and harmony when we talk about it in calligraphy. So ping han and um, jin doi. Um, those are the two major concepts that we talk about in calligraphy. Another concept that we want to talk about is also um, kind of size and thickness. So good calligraphy, arguably from some um, calligraphists, is making sure that there's a diversity in size as well as the thickness in the stroke. So it should not be um, homogenous throughout the stroke. There is um, for instance, you can see that it kind of tapers off at the beginning here and then thickens and kind of comes to a point. Or this one stroke over here, if you can see my mouse, it's a very thin line, then it becomes a very thick one, and then it recesses back into a tapered point at the end over there. So all these components together really um, create the core of kind of calligraphy aesthetics. Um, there's a lot of different rules depending on the school. Um, you can notice here, like even though it's not symmetrical here, for instance, I've been able to rebalance it by providing a bit more weight on the second stroke here, um, whereas it's smaller than that here. So balance here, even though it's not symmetrical, you can recreate that balance by um, altering the character itself. Um, so I'm gonna go through each of the characters, um, because I'm assuming that not everybody knows how to read Chinese or write Chinese characters. Um, stroke order is quite important, um, because without knowing the right stroke order, you won't be able to um, do those things around symmetry or balancing the character properly if you're doing it in the wrong order. Um, doing it in the right order, there's sometimes debate what is the right order, but generally there are some accepted ways of writing a character so that you don't lose that balance. Um, so um, we'll go through each of the three characters. So Dong meaning middle or China. Um, just um, if you look at this character over in the middle here, it's actually originally meant to be flags with a drum inside. So Dong would be kind of the sound that you would hear from a drum, a Dong, 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 Dong. Like it is very much a meaning of like bringing people together it's a marker of middleness. Um, the idea of middle being part of China, though, is actually a recent construction by the Qing Dynasty, so 200, 300 years ago. Um, China became to become, in a national kind of sense, more middle. Um, but before that, the, the idea of middle China being synonymous was not so clear, actually. So this is a four-stroke character. It starts with this one on the left, and then you do the second stroke. This is one stroke that goes um, cross left to right, and then you go down, and then you do a, another horizontal, and that creates a box. So you, when that box is created, it's easier to do that central stroke in the middle to make sure that you have equal distance. I mean, not equal distance, but equal spacing of those holes in between. Um, when you do that vertical stroke, um, you want also a short head versus a long head because that tail, when you're doing that stroke up to down, um, the bottom part is more important for its length. Um, so make sure even though there's symmetry left, right, the symmetry top bottom is actually weighted towards the bottom actually. Um, 
Another thing to note, um, symmetry again, if you are pushing one of the characters inwards, like on one side, you should be pushing it symmetrically back on the other. Um, it's quite important to keep that in mind. Um, hopefully, like feel free to interrupt me if there's any questions because um, I, I am not too sure what the language level or um, reading level is here for Chinese. So um, more than welcome. The second character is Wa, which means um, historically flower, um, but it has been more associated with the word Chinese. Um, so not Chinese in the national sense, but more in the cultural sense. Um, so the Chinese would use the word flower because it was more kind of related to their clothes. Um, they saw their clothes as very much flourishing and flowery. Um, and that was something of connection um, amongst a lot of Chinese people back then. Um, this is a 12 stroke character. It is quite complex <laughs> um, compared to the other one. The other one was basically a box with a line in the middle. This one you can imagine as four plus signs. Um, the character order is quite important. Um, I mean, the stroke order. Um, that said, I prefer to do the horizontal line first before the vertical. So when I do demonstrate this in a video coming up, um, you will notice that, um, that I prefer to do um, the horizontal before the vertical. Um, this slideshow um, will be shared with you um, after. So if you need a reminder on the stroke order, definitely take a look. I also have videos posted on YouTube um, coming up to show my mod, um, variation of the stroke order. Um, once again, that spacing between is quite important. So when you're doing all the horizontal lines, that's where you're able to you know, determine how much spacing apart is between the strokes. Um, and again, um, you can notice over here, this stroke is quite long compared to the others because you want to make sure that there's balance throughout the character. You don't want all of this to be all equally the same distance um, because it makes the character look quite um, square. Whereas what we're trying to achieve here is maybe a, something that kind of comes to the middle a little tighter and then broadens out in the center and then back to the um, kind of tapers towards the end. The last one um, is gate, um, so moon. Um, I see it as a seven stroke character. Um, some other books will say it's an eight stroke character. Um, again, strong vertical lines and making sure that they are parallel, um, not parallel, but like they're reflecting each other. So if one side is straight, the other side should be straight as well. If they're going outwards, um, they should respond to each other as well. Um, try to avoid doing it inwards though, because um, it makes the space a little tight in the center. Um, that kind of void space in the middle is quite important. Um, and again, those spaces between, so those boxes with the line in the center and making sure that there's equal spaces in between is important. And again, the symmetry, there, you can see this kind of imaginary middle line here. Um, that reflection is quite important as well. Um, as I was saying, there's different ways of doing the stroke order. These are some variants. The one that I usually buy to is B over here, um, but I do combine the stroke over here and that stroke into one. So when it comes to holding a, uh, a brush, um, it's very important to understand that you will be holding the brush differently than what you would be doing with a pencil. Um, a brush needs to be held upright um, vertically um, so that there is um, more control in how much pressure you push down on the brush. Um, because when you're pushing down the brush, you provide that extra thickness. And when you're lifting it um, or pivoting it, you can control how much um, weight um, the brush is giving and how much ink is being um, placed onto the paper, essentially. Um, so. If you are to hold it, um, definitely, like I said, keep it upright. Um, your uh, index and your middle finger should be the one holding it in the center over here. And your middle finger is the one that kind of pivots the brush. And when you're applying pressure up and down, you're using your entire hand to kind of push it up or push it down as well. So 
Um, I know this is actually in French when I look at this. Um, apologies, but hopefully, uh, hopefully you can understand it. If you need translation, I can also provide that as well. Um, I'm gonna turn off my virtual background actually right now. So um, I'm just gonna demonstrate how much ink you should be using. So when you're getting your paintbrush, um, it should be like, like I said, the bristles should be loose and you're gonna soak it in water. You can use that through a faucet. Right now I have water, but now I got this wet. You want to squeeze as much moisture and water out of it. Um, and you want to also make sure that the tip is pointed. So it should form a single point. If it's forming two points, that's not good. You want this to be quite pointed at the end. As for ink, so I'm gonna just shift my computer this way. Sorry, you'll be seeing most of my apartment. <laughs> so ink, you don't want too much ink actually. Um, two squirts from this, like not hard squirts, but I'll show you just the right amount. I don't know if you can see that, but not too much ink actually is required for a brush of this size. And what you want to do is once you have that ready with your paper, um, so my paper over here, if you're using standard calligraphy paper, but you can use other paper as well, you want to use the rough side of the calligraphy paper, not the smooth side. Um, if you do have calligraphy paper. If you don't, um, don't worry about this. You want a, um, a surface that is more rough rather than smooth. Um, the slippery side um, is not good for the traction of the ink with the brush. So what I'm gonna do is when you are getting ink into the brush, you're not putting the entire brush into it. You really just want the, um, the bottom half. And what are you gonna do is make sure that not all the ink is staying on. Like you don't wanna saturate the brush. You wanna make sure that it is um, somewhat uh, dry, but also has quite a bit of ink. So when you're testing it on paper or testing it on um, uh, um, tissue or paper towel, it should not bleed through. Um, and that should give you a good sense of how much ink you should be using. Because otherwise, if you have too much ink, it will bleed throughout the paper and it will just create wet splotches throughout. You really want um, to control the amount of ink saturated into that brush. So when I do write over here, um, and I'll show you in a pre-recorded video, so um, it shouldn't be bleeding too much. So this is the right amount. Whereas if I was to saturate it, so I'm just gonna dab a lot into it and try it again. Sorry, you won't be able to see this really well, but I'll do this with really saturated ink to demonstrate a point. But like you can see already too much ink will make it quite fat, um, but also it bleeds throughout the paper. So just keep that in mind, make sure that the ink is not saturated throughout the paper, uh, the brush. Otherwise, you will get pretty sloppy strokes and not too much control. All right, so I'm gonna go back to two videos demonstrating um, kind of the, uh, because it's easier for me to explain it um, this way, um, because I can pause and talk about it. Um, this is not it though. So here's a quick demonstration of writing Dong Wamun, but this is um, using small text. So you can see this is the box that's being formed here. So what I, I'm gonna pause here. So what you wanna do is place the tip of your um, brush on the paper and then press down. Once you press down, you're gonna pause because what you wanna do when you pause is create a very strong defined corner at the top of the, the stroke. And then what you're gonna do is drag that brush across without lifting the brush. So you can see over here, there is a bit more of a defined 
um, kind of stroke at the beginning of this of this line, and the weight of the stroke um, vertically continues down consistently. Once you are past that box, um, you want to slowly lift that brush while still dragging it across downwards. So there you can see that it tapers off towards the end. So um, when you place these, um, the brush down, you want to pause, drag it across, slowly lift as it goes across. For the next character, so I'll go through this again. Um, you can see that there is a kind of variation on the wetness of the stroke. And depending on the stroke, so the horizontal and the vertical, you can see that um, there's different weights. The, the horizontal are thicker, whereas the, the vertical, I tend to taper them off as um, we were doing with the previous character. And again, that vertical stroke here, you can see it tapers off towards the bottom. So this last character, Moon, and I'll have a bigger version that play next. Um, it's just to give you a sense of the stroke order as well as how much control you need to provide on that brush. Um, there's a lot of attention and control that needs to be focused on this. So this last stroke here actually is quite important and I'll do it again here. So that last stroke, that one over here that goes across, pivots down and then forms that kind of check mark over here. I'm gonna just do that slowly here. So you want to use the tip of your brush, drag it across left to right, and then you're gonna pause, press down your brush downwards. That's gonna create that defined corner that you see over here. And then you're gonna slowly lift your brush as it drags it across downwards, but you're gonna maintain that weight um, so you're not tapering it off, it's just you're going to vary the thickness of that line as it goes across vertically. And then when you go towards the bottom, you're going to stop again, and you're actually going to um, press down at a slant the brush so it forms that check mark. When you press down, you're going to pause. And then when you're finished pausing, you're gonna lift that um, paintbrush quite quickly, actually release it upwards. So when you see this check mark going upwards, you can see that I release it quite quickly. At the same time, you're also making sure that your paintbrush is lifting up at the same time. So it is quite a, um, there's a lot of detail to capture here and I, I will be around to um, answer any questions. I know this is, maybe a lot of information coming in. So I do apologize, but um, for the 10 minutes that I have, um, hopefully this is um, somewhat of a good idea at first, um, how to look at calligraphy. Again, this vertical stroke, that pause, and then dragging it across and then slowly lifting towards the bottom half so it tapers. And I'll do that again. Um, but for this one, it's this left stroke here. So it's tapers at the beginning. You're gonna press that brush down. You're gonna drag it across down and you're gonna taper off at the end to form a point. So I have a larger one here um, just to show. Um, so that was a very tiny, like that would be that two by two kind of square format. This one will be the three by three, maybe even larger actually. Um, so you can see it here again. I'm dragging it across. I paused and I slanted my brush down, dragged it across. And you can see that slow release towards the bottom half. Again, this is, so when I do the plus signs, I usually do it horizontally then vertically first. It helps me kind of focus on how to space these apart. Again, the spacing between these 
um, horizontal lines should be quite equidistant. And that's the character for wa. And last up again, um, the last character moon for gate um, will demonstrate again. Sorry, this is really slow mo. <laughs> Across, stop, corner, again, goes down. And again, stop. This one, I actually didn't vary the weight of this stroke. So it's like, I, I see that as a, not a great stroke for myself, but um, I, I, I think you get a sense of it. So just going back, um, also one thing to know um, for this character, you notice that I might have a bit of an extension over here. Um, if you make your line a little too wide, it's okay to like, make that vertical line at the middle of that stroke rather than um, at the end. Nothing, like not nothing. I mean, I like you don't want to make, like it's okay to have kind of extra bits hanging out on a character. <laughs> um, that sounds really bad, but <laughs> um, like the, the purpose is really to make sure that the character has equal spacing within. And if you are gonna try to connect it and make it perfect like this, like, and let's say this is a little wide, it doesn't look great. So if you have, you know, an extra bit hanging here, that's okay. Um, just keep that in mind. Don't be so, like, you don't want to be a stickler of how this, how your character looks compared to what's being written here. Um, because there's a diversity of ways of writing the same character. Um, and that's, so um, I'm open to questions. I've got a question. So you were saying that um, you like for these for these characters that you would tend to do the horizontals first. Um, is that the case for like uh, for like all the characters that you would do? Is that you would tend to um, do the horizontal? Like, like in any of the strokes, it's always like horizontal first. Um, I, I'm just thinking if there's any cases where like, uh, I, I would say for this character, I tend to do the horizontal first, not all characters. Okay. Um, like I said, like there's different schools and there's different opinions on what is the proper stroke order. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's so like for me, the horizontal makes sense because I'm able to space those things apart easier. Whereas I think um, some people might be looking for other ways of spacing apart and maybe the vertical first makes sense for them. Right. If that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to interject as well. Depending on the characters, for example, the word country is like a big square with uh, the character J inside. Um, mm -hmm. You may have seen it like in the um, the first two would be vertical uh, for that, that kind of square uh, character. Uh, the, the, the one for just illustrate uh, is the one unit from top down. The vertical is the top, which meaning like plants or flowers. But there are other Chinese characters that may, be, um, may have two components, left and right, top and down. So to answer Karen's question, it really depending on what characters uh, you're, you're writing. Yeah, just to demonstrate um, the character for um, country she was saying. So the first stroke is usually the vertical stroke here. So. Great. If there are more questions, we can we can save them till later at the end when we when we're all making things. Um, so I'm gonna do some segueing. I think I can share my screen now, and I can introduce Wailing and also like a little bit, a few more pictures. So looks like I can. Sh 
share. So I just wanted to, I noticed the chat, someone mentioned that this was so soothing. And uh, this is just a uh, display of Paul's teachers and Paul's teacher, his name is Teacher Chen. He does this every day and it is like, it promotes health and calmness. So that is something that um, is practiced in calligraphy. And look, here's Paul. And uh, we're, we're learning from Teacher Chen right here. And so just to give you an idea of what these wishes look like, um, this is a sample that we scanned and uh, we did a bunch of workshops in 2017, mostly during Chinese New Year um, and all, at all the malls. We like to celebrate Chinese New Year in malls in Edmonton, maybe because it's so cold. And so we've collected like, I think over 60 in 2017. And we created the, this public installation. This is where the Harbin Gate used to be. And um, I, I think I remember the first um, day I revisited the gate, I was like, I feel sad now, but I'm going to quickly forget this uh, sadness. So um, these memories visually mark uh, what we like honor, remember of, of an important site for the Chinese community and the Chinatown community. So uh, some more close-ups of some, someone wrote a little uh, a description. And to our happiness, the construction workers took such great care of these wishes. They lasted for like a half a year. And we got to see um, like the colors of the uh, wishes kind of fade away and age. Um, and so I'd like to introduce you to Wai Ling. This is Wai Ling teaching us how to crochet earlier on this summer. For this exhibit, well, for the exhibit, she, I think she crocheted 122 all by herself. And um, so Sean made one, <laughs> Lan made one. I need to still learn. Um, so um, I would like to pass this on to Wyling now, and I'm going to stop sharing. And any questions, we'll all work it out at the end. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Wyling. Okay. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Maybe let's warm up our fingers a little bit before we need to do anything. Um, yeah, I know with uh, uh, calligraphy, when you uh, hold a brush, your, your fingers may be a little bit tense. And then now we're moving on and on activity, you also need to use your fingers. So maybe we just play, play with it a little bit. Um, before we start, I'd like to uh, thank Sean for uh, PB Court, um, the, the co-sharing segments I'd like to present to you today. Um, and, and I think with that um, close up, you may have a, a better idea uh, than when I do it. Um, on live right when, when now, okay. And also I want to uh, add to what Grace just said about seeing uh, the banners and the doilies hung on the fence. Um, that to me, uh, it, it was like a way to honor our pioneers, you know, could be in Edmonton for over a hundred years and all the work they have done in the neighborhood, you know, how they help each other to, to survive in a very harsh environment. You know, not only the climate, but also the, the cultural uh, differences and the acceptance of the, the so-called the mainstream society. Like to me, um, the doilies and the banners almost like it's a way for us to thank them. You know, what they have done kind of pace uh, the, uh, the road that we have now. Uh, I think Chinese people have much better, uh, easier time now than a hundred years ago. And I think we need to acknowledge that. I, I was very really happy that we have the opportunity to do the doilies and the banners to um, visually acknowledge that. I hope that the public, when they see that, uh, they will trigger them to, to feel similar way and have a, a gratitude uh, feeling towards the pioneers. Today, I'm very happy to be here to show you a few basic steps of crocheting. We are going to learn how to make a, a slip knot, a single stitch, um, and double stitch. And of course, before that, we need to learn how to do a foundation chain. 
And that's the basic of crocheting. First of all, I'd like to show you the crochet hook. Okay. There are many parts of the crochet hook. The easiest one you know is the long handle. And right here, where it's flat, this is where you position your thumb and your index finger. And hold almost like holding a pencil. And some people put the uh, middle finger underneath, and that's what I usually do. Right here, this section is called shaft, and that's where you hold uh, the, the loop. Uh, when we crochet, you'll see how useful this will be. And over here, it's called throat, like the throat of uh, you know, joining your head and your neck. So this is a hook where you uh, bring your yarn through the loop. Okay, this is called the, th the throat. And on the other side, right here is called point. And this is where you use it to insert into the stitches when you crochet. Before we start crocheting, we need to make a slip knot. Okay, one end of the yarn, I tape uh, a small a piece of paper there to remind myself that's taped end. The opposite end is connected to the ball. So I'm going to put the working end. This is called the working end. I'm going to put the working end on top. Okay, the working end on top of the tape end. Now I'm going to put a finger way where the two yarn are intersect. Put my finger there and then the other finger the thumb and the mid, uh, index finger, they are going in the loop and pick up the working end. At this point, I will pull the tape end. I will pull the tape end to tighten the knot. Okay. Now, we have a slip knot here, but it's very really big. I need to make it bigger. Okay, so how do I do that? I will pull the working end now to make it a little bit smaller for my crocheting purpose. Okay. So let me put my crochet hook through the loop. Now, it's still too big for me. All I need to do is just pull the working end that will tighten uh, the loop that I need to use, all right? Now, I'm going to uh, show you how to make a chain stitch, okay? I'm going to use one hand to have a yarn over the hook and use my thumb and my index finger hold on to the knot. And I'm going to gently pull the yarn through the loop. So that is the first chain stitch. Okay. So I'm going to do a few more. You see how I hold my crochet hook. Okay. My thumb is resting there comfortably and my index finger and my um, tall man finger, the middle finger is supporting it. Okay. So I'm going to um, use this pinky, just hold on to this end to help me out. I'm going to use the, oh sorry, I'm going to use the working end, okay, you use the working end of the yarn, okay. The working end, wrap around the crochet hook, hold on to the last stitch that I made, and gently pull it through the loop, okay. One more time, yarn over thumb and um, middle finger, hold on to the last chain stitch and the right hand where the crochet hole is, you pull gently, gently through the loop. Okay. Again, okay. so I'm going to do a few more. This activity, you need, really need both hands to work together. Okay, one more time. All together, I want to make 10. If you look at it, you can see like a letter V. You can see oh my God, the, sh the yarn looks like a letter V. Now we have learned how to make the, the chain stitch. 
and the whole thing it is called foundation ch um, chain so it's like many of them so I'm going to put my crochet hook back to the loop I use this finger to kind of put, tighten it a little bit okay. and my thumb and my uh, middle finger hold on to the stitch so it's not going to slide back and forth I have control over how big, how small. If you hold this too tight, then it's dif very difficult to pull through. If it's too loose, then your stitches uh, would not look nice and it would be too loose. Uh, the whole piece is not uneven. Okay, now I'm going to show you, this is where the loop is. I'm going to insert into the one next to it. Okay, next to it, not the one where the loop comes out. Okay, here's the loop. I'm going to poke, insert right here. One, two, if you see, one, two, two pieces of yarn above, I'm going to put right underneath. So at the base has only one piece of yarn. Okay, so I'm going to insert the crochet hook here, yarn over, bring it through. So now you see the two loops, one and two, one and two on your shaft. I'm going to do yarn over again. I'm going to pull this yarn through both loops at one pull. So this is a single stitch. Okay. So I'm going to do it again. I'm going to the next stitch on the foundation chain. Okay. So it's right here, okay. Remember the two pieces on the top, I'm going to poke right here. And it has only one piece at the bottom. So I'm going to insert and yarn over, pull through the stitch. Now I have one and two, one and two loops on my uh, shaft of my crochet hook. Yarn over, yarn over, and pull one loop and two loops by one action. Okay, again, there is the fourth single stitch. Looks good. Next, we are going to learn how to make a double crochet. I'm going to count, uh, see. One, two, three, four. I'm going to put my finger here on the fourth one to remind myself that's where I'm going to put insert my crochet hook. Okay, so this one you do yarn over first and insert into the fourth stitch we just counted, yarn over. Bring it through the stitch. Now you see the three loops on the shaft. We're going to do yarn over. The first pull goes only one, two loops. Then yarn over. And this time we put through both of them. Okay, so this is called double crochet. Okay, first yarn over and next stitch. Remember what we did last time? The two pieces on top and one at the bottom, from one piece of yarn at the bottom here. Okay, so put it through, yarn over, bring it through. Okay, so by now you see three loops. One, two, three on the shaft, yarn over, first go through one and two. Second, yarn over, pull through both loops. Okay, so this is the second uh, double crochet. This is uh, the three stitches we have uh, started by counting four back with four stitches. So we have one vertical stitch, and then we have this, 
second, third, and fourth. So we have four vertical stitch, and this I call double crochet. So how are you feeling? A little bit excited? Or did you remember to breathe? We have learned a lot today. We learned how to make a foundation chain, and this is called chain stitch. And this is really the foundation of crocheting. From here, you, uh, we, you build on it. And we built a um, single stitch. Okay. Single stitch. Yeah, single stitch, they're very, very short. And usually used to, uh, to end uh, your creation, to give it some support. And we also learn how to make double crochet and you see the double crochet is much longer than the single crochet okay so in a lot of um, clothing or people make um, crochet um, cotton thread cotton bags uh, people use a lot of uh, the double crochet yeah. and, it, and both are very useful but you probably see this more uh, often in many uh, crochet artwork now I'd like to show you how we use what we learned today. The um, double crochet is um, where you see the gray, but before that, we had to uh, prepare the foundation chain, and that's the center, that's the foundation chain that, where the double crochet built on. And then by increasing the number of uh, double crochet, then you expand the circle, and that's how we made this doily. And the last black uh, trim around it, that's the single crochet. So these are the doilies that we made uh, for the Harbin Gate uh, project uh, in Edmonton. Um, we want to make it colorful to remember uh, the Harbin Gate, um, to honor all the beautiful uh, contributions our pioneers uh, have done to, to the community in Edmonton and in Alberta. So we have learned a lot, and I hope you have fun learning what I had. And I hope you continue practicing. The more you practice, the better control you will have over the crochet hook and, and the yarn. It really does feel like we're all together here today, even virtually. Um, Griffin has never done a workshop like this before with Zoom, and it's just been really amazing. So. Um, just a huge thank you to everyone, to everyone who spoke today and everyone who attended. Um, thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much. So nice to meet you. Um, and um, I hope you enjoyed the rest of your Sunday.